I'm doing some cosmetic changes. We're being recorded, Jack. We're live. We're, we're, wired, of, we're wired for sound. Unlike Martha Mitchell. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of introducing and moderating this panel today. Uh, we have um, four extraordinary speakers. We have Jack Devine, Milton Bearden, Jonathan Ward, and Rachel Van Linhan. Uh, Rachel will be addressing international legal issues that arise from Putin's invasion of Ukraine, um, both from uh, the human rights perspective, war crimes, as well as um, the relationship between law and international alliances as they affect the ability of the Ukraine to resist the Russian invasion. Jack and Milton, I have the pleasure of introducing, will be discussing the status update and operations and how US support and allied support are supporting the Ukraine's resistance to the Russian invasion on the ground. And then I will have the pleasure of introducing Jonathan, who will be addressing the interplay between China, the PRC, and um, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, Putin's invasion, and how that may or may not fit into Chinese grand strategy. Um, let me start my introduction. Rachel, Professor Rachel Van Anderham is Professor of Law at the Southwest, Southwestern Law School, Los Angeles, California, where she currently teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and national security law. Prior to teaching, Professor Manaham was on active duty in the U.S. Air Force for 20 years, including more than a decade as a judge advocate, with tours focusing on both criminal law as an international law at headquarters, U.S. Central Command. She advised on operational and international legal issues related to the armed conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, and was the command's chief liaison to the International Committee of the Red Cross. Professor Manaham is the president of the National Institute of Military Justice, the only U.S. nonprofit dedicated to fairness and transparency in American military justice systems. She's the co-author of the 2015 Oxford University Press, Military Operations, Law, Policy, and Practice, which details the operationalization of law across the spectrum of US military operations, and is co-editor of the 2020 Military Criminal Casebook, Military Justice Cases and Materials, third edition. She's also the author of numerous law review articles regarding military criminal law, international, humanitarian law, freedom of expression in the military and in the war, and the insurrection of the federal crime of material support to terrorism and social media, and was a 2015 win winner of the Benjamin Perens essay competition for her article, Criminally Disproportionate Warfare, Aggression as a Contextual War Crime. She's a frequent media commentator regarding military issues. And the next I have to introduce, my pleasure, is um, Jack Devine. Jack is a 32-year veteran of the CIA, where he served with distinction as chief of its worldwide operations. He served abroad in several countries, five as chief of station. He also directed the CIA Counter Narcotics Center and the Latin American Division at the height of the drug war, and was in charge when drug, thing, drug, drug kingpin Pablo Escobar met his demise. And a propose of today's discussion in the late 1980s, Jack headed up the CIA's Afghan task force in its efforts to drive the Russians out of Afghanistan. Jack is currently, Jack currently is president and founding partner of the Arkin Group, a New York-based international consulting and intelligence firm. The next I have to introduce, who I have again the pleasure and honor of introducing is Milton Bearden. Milton Bearden is a 30-year veteran of the CIA, of CIA operations. He was intimately involved in the CIA program that drove the Soviet army out of Afghanistan in the 1980s. He sees the lessons learned from that undertaking potentially being applied to Vladimir Putin's Ukrainian adventure at some later stage. And last, but not least, in batting order, I have the pleasure of introducing Jonathan Ward. Dr. Jonathan Ward completed his Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Oxford, specializing in China-Indian relations. He, was pre he has presented on Chinese military space and nuclear policy at the annual People's Liberation Army Conference at the U.S. Army War College lectured at the U.S. Naval Academy, the Naval Submarine League, and the Army and Navy Club in London, and presented on the rise of Chinese and Indian navies at Rusi's International Sea Power Conference. He has spoken on China-India relations at the Economic Research Council in London, the Oxford India Center for Sustainable Development, and the Institute of Chinese Studies in New Delhi, among other venues. An American citizen, he studied philosophy, Russian, and Chinese at Kalam University, and continued his language studies at Beijing University in China and St. Petersburg State University in Russia. He speaks Russian, Chinese, Spanish, and Arabic 
consultant, consults on China-India relations and the Indo-Pacific. He has traveled extensively in Russia, China, India, and the Indian Ocean region. He's a member of the Energy Institute and the Economic Research Council in London, a research associate at the Changing Character of War Program, the University of Oxford, and a graduate of the Oxford Chicago Evaluation Program at Oxford Said Business School. He is the founder of the recent established Atlas organization, a consultancy with advisors on China and their strategic interests. John, incidentally, I'd like a parenthetical. Um, both Jack and Milton Jonathan authored extraordinary treatises, and I've given them the opportunity to present those treatises during their discussion. Jonathan has authored China's Vision of Victory, which is extraordinary. Jack has recently authored two, two books, one Good Hunting and the other Spy Master's Prison, quotations, which I hope we'll elaborate on. And Milt has a number of articles as well as books that he's published. Milton recently published um, an article on foreign affairs on Putin's debacle in the Ukraine, asking the question whether Putin has not learned lessons from Afghanistan, Putin's Afghanistan. On that note, I, I turn this, this, this panel over to Rachel. Rachel, are you ready, my dear? Uh, good morning. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I am. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. And it's truly my honor to be in such esteemed company, with Jonathan, Jack, and, and Milton. Um, I feel like I've been asked to write my final exam in, in one of my international law or, or national security law classes because the Russia's illegal war of aggression against Ukraine raises just a veritable cornucopia of international law issues, uh, ranging from from the use ad bellum to the use of the law, international law governing the resort to the use of force on the international stage, obviously to international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, which is the use in bellow, war crimes, um, and and so much, so much in between. So with such limited time today, I, I was, it's a, uh, and in knowing that there are so many individuals on this webinar that are, are, are far more expert than I in, in many of these nuanced areas. Um, and, and I encourage them to, to speak up and ask questions or, or say things when they have that, have the opportunity. Um, so with the, with the challenging, challenging assignment of talking about international law issues related to uh, related to the war. And, it, and it's hard to even do this with a smile. I mean, I know people personally affected, as many of us do, um, by this terrible, terrible, um, the atrocities that are occurring. And I think the atrocities that are occurring on a larger scale than we have, the world has seen since World War II. Um, and the fact that, you know, life goes on and, uh, and our kids are getting out of school, um, you know, and summer starts, it's just, it's really sobering um, to be able to come together and speak about this topic today. So again, there are way too many international law issues to, to speak to with fidelity and nuance and hopefully, and, and I'm positive many of my colleagues will, will zoom in into some, some issues as we go. But I wanna start with the big picture first. Um, and the big picture is that it seems like at a very real and yet almost theoretical and, and philosophical level, Russia seems intent to overturn the rule of law on the international stage itself. So if you talk about international law issues, before we unpackage that, let's look at international law itself and its construct designed to help bring about stability on the, on the world stage, as well as to further human development and growth through the promotion and protection of human rights. Um, and it seems that this, the war of aggression is part and parcel of a modus operandi to engage in a full frontal assault on that rule of law itself. So I, one of the international law issues is the health of international law um, and the instrumentalization of the law, um, which has occurred and has always occurred on numerous levels, but the really turning law on its head and ignoring any kind of stability benefits that come from law long-term and adherence to the rule of law um, via international law construct um, and just and just wanting to use it in a purely 100% instrumental way um, to further Russia's aims um, with the with the consequences, the collateral consequences to global stability um, not factoring into their into their equation whatsoever. And as our colleagues will mention, my colleagues will will surely mention later, um, it seems China is has been engaging in part and 
in at least in part um, in this degradation and misuse and abuse and, and assault on on what international law does itself, what what the rule of law does on the global stage. And that's terribly, terribly concerning. International law has always been at the vanishing edge of the law itself because of the lack of a global enforcer, the lack of the executive branch. Um, but I think today it's 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 in perilous it's in perilous straits. So that was the first picture, first big picture issue. I just wanted to, to throw out there again in a very limited amount of time. I'm just going to throw out some issues and and uh, happy to discuss them in greater detail later. Um, I think that this most simplest international legal issue, um, even though perhaps it's the biggest because it's the crime of all crimes, to quote the wonderful indomitable Benjamin Ferenz, um, that is the gross use ad bellum violation committed by Russia and its and its active aggression against um, against Ukraine in February. But and that is the crime of of aggression against Ukraine. But I. Surely no, folks don't need the reminder, but I'll put it out there anyway, that there has been an ongoing armed conflict, right, um, starting in 2014 with Russia's illegal annexation um, of Crimea and then the, the um, uh, support of, of the separatists um, fighting, fighting um, uh, in the Donbass. So the fact that, but... February was so much more on a grander and more blatant scale. There was no attempt to use the little green men to try to hide behind that Russia tried to do in Crimea rather unsuccessfully to evade attribution. Um, here it was the use ad bellum was the violent, viol the blatant violation. So to go back just for the few folks on here that, that are unfamiliar with that term, the use ad bellum is the international legal framework regarding um, the resort to the use of force by, by nation states um, on the global stage, and it's and it, today's modern incantation is the UN the United Nations Charter, um, which prohibits, of course, the use of force against territorial um, integrity and political independence of, of another state, um, with a few exceptions, such as such as self defense, um, or the use of force in any manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations Charter. Um, and that was um, blatantly ignored and violated in the annexation of Crimea in 2014 and to an even grosser and more blatant extent um, in February and, and ongoing. Um, that, is, that is, I think, the, the simplest legal issue. Um, and whether or not, and whether and how to hold uh, Putin and Russia to account for, for such a blatant um, uh, violation of the UN Charter is, is another story. Um, and I'll get a little bit into that in, in a bit, I hope. Um, I'd like to highlight that, of course, Russia, Ukraine is justified in using self-defense, using force and self-defense, which is an exception to the prohibition against the use of force that's laid out in the United Nations Charter. Um, and its allies would be justified in using force in collective self-defense if they chose to use armed force. Um, again, per this use ad bellum, per the international structure governing the resort to the use of force. I'd like to highlight that Article 51 of the UN Charter does supersede, I believe, and many experts believe any old remnants of neutrality obligations um, if they actually exist at all in this post-UN Charter global, global arena. Um, but as we've seen, the allies such as the United States and the West have not chosen to use force, to use armed force in collective self-defense of Ukraine. Um, Jonathan asked me to mention NATO. Of course, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization um, is an organization set up after mm. World War II that provides for collective self-defense and actually under Article 5, an obligation to use force, um, a promise uh, to collectively uh, defend one another in case of attack. And Ukraine is not a member of of NATO and that, um, and uh, perhaps the hopes one day to become part of NATO um, has been used as part of it as a as a, as an excuse by Russia, as well as as the claim false mm. claims of genocide, et cetera, for for starting this uh, a, a war of aggression. Um, but the reason I bring up whether the UN Charter and um, and the collect idea of collective self defense, which it is to bring up the fact is who is in armed conflict? Who is a part of the armed conflict right now? Um, and why does that why does that matter? Are the massive amounts of money, arms, 
um, resources and actionable intelligence, operational intelligence being provided to Ukraine by Western nations. Does that mean the United States is at war? Does that mean that Germany is at war? Does that mean that France is at war against Russia in an armed conflict, an international armed conflict to use the modern parlance against, um, against Russia? Um, does that trans does all of that assistance transform the states providing it into parties to the to the conflict? Um, such assistance does not seem uh, there seems to be a consensus. It does not seem to violate neutral neutrality rules um, because those rules are superseded by Article 51 um, in the UN Charter. But even if there were violations of, of old hoary neutrality rules, those don't vis-a-vis -vis transform a state into a co-belligerent. Um, even though at one point President Putin did did declare that the United States was engaged in war, quote unquote, with Russia um, because <coughs> of economic sanctions, which is a frightening, a frightening um, statement to make. Um, so it's the 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 there's general consensus that provision of arms and resources and money does not transform any of those providers into parties to the armed conflict so they are technically not engaged in an armed conflict with russia one interesting aspect of that is that's that's received quite a bit of press as it well it should um is the providing of actionable intelligence um by the united states and its allies uh to to ukraine and the fact that some of that intelligence at least as reported by the New York Times and other venues, resulted in the uh, the um, the lawful killing as a lawful military objective by Ukraine of 12 or more Russian generals. Um, it was interesting that when the United States, in response to that, um, officials from the Department of Defense stressed that um, that individual generals' locations were not provided, just uh, I, and that uh, there was no coordination of, of, of targeting. In fact, that it was the provision of information regarding tactical um, tactical um, command centers. Um, and the same thing regarding the Russian warship that was that was destroyed, is that going on, on two months now? Um, the, and the role of the United States uh, provision of intelligence um, in, in, that, in that targeting. And again, the United States stressed that, that um, they were not involved in the actual targeting decision. Um, and so there is definitely a line, a, a legal line and a political, more of a political line as well, of course, of how much uh, assistance, particularly when you get to the intelligence arena, how much assistance can be provided without crossing the red line into which transforming the United States and its allies in the similar provision of, of assistance into co-belligerents in which they are engaged in an armed conflict with Russia, obviously engaging in a no-fly zone. Um, which was was uh, which was uh, zealously requested and understandably so uh, by President Zelensky numerous times at the onset of this conflict. A no-fly zone engaging in armed force, because a no-fly zone involves um, involves the use of force and taking out enemy air um, uh, suppression of enemy air air defenses and possibly you know one-on-one -on -one conflict with with aircraft uh, that are that are that are flying that would that would be a use of armed force and would obviously make the united states and any parties engaged in that no fly zone um, a party to the armed conflict but the provision of, of weapons and resources assistance and money, <clears throat> money money does not um but when it gets to the intelligence component um that's where geeks like me find it quite fascinating because it really depends on concrete examples the concrete details of the intelligence provided and how closely integrated that information was how much coordination there was um and with the provision of the with the provision of the intelligence with the data and the actual use of it to cause harm to the enemy to, to russia um I, my time is almost up so i want to go on to another legal issue of course deals with with lawfare and that is the battle of international law um in numerous forums and numerous uh it's important of course for for democracies to take to take action against authoritarian adversaries when they're wronged. Um, and Ukraine has engaged in a multi-pronged legal strategy. There's at least five international tribunals um, uh, that have been engaged in. Uh, the, one of the most well-known, of course, was Ukraine's actions um, at The Hague, at the International Court of Justice, um, uh, 
uh, under under the Convention Against uh, Genocide, um, in which they asked for provisional measures um, to be issued judgments against Russia, which were successful. Um, uh, the uh, 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 well successful in having it issued against them issued against Russia, but of course the enforcement mechanism um, is what's it's what's lacking. There's not there's not been a full decision on the merits there. We also have the International Criminal Court, even though Russia and uh, again, this is just a brief over, uh, overview of Russia and uh, Ukraine are not parties to the International Criminal Court, which was set up um, to be a standing Nuremberg. So these ad hoc tribunals of the Inter International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, the similar one for Rwanda, Sierra Leone, et cetera, were stand up ad hoc tribunals set up under the auspices of the Security Council. Mm -hmm. Instead of having to do that, the need um, there was a need for a standing standing Nuremberg court, and of course that's the ICC. Um, Ukraine did ask um, uh, uh, and accede to jurisdiction uh, following the the uh, illegal annexation of, of Crimea. Um, otherwise, and otherwise the uh, ICC would not have had jurisdiction. And uh, as 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 you all know, the ICC has announced and, and has been engaged in an investigation um, into war crimes on on the territory of Ukraine with that appropriate uh, jurisdiction that was provided um, by Ukraine. Um, there are so many other issues, such as war crimes trials to British nationals, um, to, to United States uh, citizens that uh, were reported um, uh, very recently to have been to have been captured or in detention right now in in uh, uh, either in, in Russian controlled territory of Ukraine or in Russia itself. I'm not quite sure. There's issues dealing with um, blockades. We saw in the New York Times just yesterday uh, you know, various leading international figures um, declaring that there's a that the blockade that Russia is engaged in against against Ukrainian ports is is actually a war crime um, uh, because of the deleterious effects uh, and and possible starvation in, in other countries outside of uh, primarily in Africa outside of uh, outside of uh, Ukraine and of course there's issues there regarding starvation as a tactic of war is is uh, um, is strictly prohibited. Uh, by the Geneva Conventions, by customary international law, but on the other hand, blockades have long been an, uh, a lawful use of a lawful tactic under under the law of war. Um, uh, so there's so many issues there. I think Jonathan, I just wanted to give that that highlight. I kept saying it was going to be brief, but I know I was very cognizant. No, that was great. Of my ten minutes. That was great, Rachel. Rachel, I have one quick question for you. Scarf. I know under Article Five, collective self-defense, the NATO Charter. Um, Ukraine is not part of NATO, but I, I look in, in the other areas where NATO and NATO plus allies lend support without crossing the line into military activities. That's why I was puzzled before. You know, I mean, if you have a NATO and NATO plus ally, obviously their alliances are not going to be with the Russian Federation. So even, you know, Ukraine isn't a part of NATO, but I always wondered, I posted Jack and Milton about this before, if originally in 2014 and 15, when NATO was invited, to join the EU, I mean, when Ukraine was invited to join the EU, if Putin didn't see that as crossing the red line of trying to bring the Ukraine within the European and European organization, and subsequently with NATO, that's that's why I, I post you that as well, yeah, because we all know that there's a strong link, or whether he used that as an ex simply another one of as an ex excuses. Um, but it doesn't. But um, even if he felt that way, he doesn't get to make the red lines. President Putin no. does not get to set international law. Um, Ukraine, NATO is free under international law to, um, to even though I don't think NATO was anywhere near allowing uh, Ukraine to join it, but they were growing closer. Um, but NATO was free to do so, and Ukraine was free to do so, and it doesn't matter what Russia of thought. Of course, politically it matters what, what Russia thinks, but Russia can't use that as an, an excuse and say, oh, we were threatened because um, they were forming alliances no. on my border. So um, I have very little good patience patience for that but of course that but that speaks to a larger issue Jonathan and that is that so much of this for example how much actionable intelligence you can provide the West can provide Ukraine before it technically becoming a, a part of the armed conflict and being at war with Russia the technicalities at some point don't matter it's what President Putin deems um, to be a to be uh, uh, what he deems to be a threat um, that he'll obviously unfortunately on. and so that's that's 
where you get to, we can we can have all the law and the legal mechanisms as, as democracies that believe in the rule of law as providing long-term stability and the promotion of human rights, um, as well as, as, you know, these Western democracies, including the United States, use international law instrumentally as well to further their own, own aims, um, but hopefully not at the expense of the overall structure. Um, but, you know, it just speaks to the fact that so much of this is, yes, you can go here, the law allows you to go here, but as, as the esteemed wonderful Professor Harold Coe is, something can be lawful, but awful. It still can be, it can be <laughs> lawful, but if you know it's gonna cross one of Putin's red lines and risk the use of perhaps nuclear weapons, et cetera, um, that of course has to be taken in consideration. So thank Rachel, you. Rachel, on that note, on, that was fantastic. I'd like to turn over the question of, God forbid, Putin using nuclear weapons and whether, to quote Milton Jack from our last program, we should get wobbly or not, I turn that over to Jack. Thank so you, we're going Rachel. to start off with <laughs> Putin and nuclear weapons. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, Jack, however you want to start. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me, I'm going to take a few minutes. I'm going to keep it short because I want to get to the questions because I think you raised the point that there's a thesis. Milt has one, ja uh, Jonathan has one, and I have a couple core ones as well. And I think I'm just going to mention the core things and then we can go from there. And then I'll answer your question about nuclear at the end. But I'm going to take three minutes at most. So you mentioned our book. So my and Spy Master's Prison, the fight against Russian aggression. Now, Jonathan pulled me aside when I wrote it last year and he said, Jack, you know, it's a great book, but it's all about China. And that's what the intelligence community told me. And when I talked to some of the folks, they said, oh, we have it covered. We're all in on China. And I said to the intelligence community, we're never all in on any single thing. And lo and behold, our negligence is paying sufficient attention to Russia I think uh, we paid a we, we paid a, uh, a cost for that. Now, my basic thesis, and again, it predates Ukraine. And in there, I talk about my visit in 2018 and what I saw and why I was concerned that Kiev was going to be the Berlin for the next round. Is understanding Putin, understand what what he's all about, what his objectives are, what Russia's objectives are. That we are the implacable enemy. We just didn't become one when we went into when the uh, Ukrainians were attacked by the Russians. And we need to, to really understand that we were in a, the Cold War never really ended in so many ways. And that's the thesis of the book. The other thing is I've written a lot of things, a lot of them I don't I don't want to frame, but I frame a couple because they stick with me. I got one up there. But I ran an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in March, and I'm hanging tough on it. And the title is you know, Putin has sowed the, the seeds of his own downfall, right? And I'm standing by that. The, the day he crossed and the way he crossed and the, the way he's handling this war and the atrocities, that his days are numbered. Now, some people read it that I meant next week, but I, I mean, he's in decline. There is no coming back from it. I mean, he might be able to hold on, it might be bloody and, and so on. And neither, these are the two main points that I wanna make and see us tease out, you know, and how is this gonna end? And what are we up against? And being realistic about it. And I know just my sense, I don't know Rachel well enough, but I sense she also has a hard edge to her. And that is, you know, I think we're prepared to call the shots the way we see them. But I think we need to be realistic about where we are and address what we're up against with Putin and how is this thing going to play out. And I think I'll be interested in bouncing around with the participants because they're all people that I have high regard for both their sub substance and ability to articulate touch, touch, uh, tough issues. On the nuclear weapon, I'm finishing, so I'm, I told you I'd keep it tight. And that is, I mean, I think it was somewhat of a desperate act to throw it out there, right? And they do have the, the possible use of nuclear weapons. But I'd have to ask, what happens the next day, Vladimir? I mean, what happens in the next five minutes? So he has to be so desperate that it's the end of the world for him and he's deciding he's going out. And I don't, I think he may, he has issues. I think he has psychological issues, but they're not so profound that he's going to try and destroy the world and himself. So, you know, I, I think I think he's a very dangerous guy, more danger, dangerous than I actually thought when I wrote the book, but I, I hammered him pretty hard. But I, I think the, the nuclear uh, the nuclear threat is, um, is a, a, an idle bluff and we shouldn't be responding. People knee jerk reaction is, oh my God, we're going to be attacked and how can we pacify him? I mean, it's really, not very realistic. And we grossly, including me, I think overestimated the strength of the Russian army. And he looks pretty weak to me to be puffing out his chest very much. So let me finish on that 
that, that, that glorious note. And let's turn it over to your next speaker. Jack, I will. I, I want actually two quick questions for you. And one concerns the authorization by President Trump of certain anti-tank missiles to the Ukraine. I think you, I don't know if you mentioned your book or not. And the other concerns the introduction of certain technologies by US well, and US allies. You got two guys on the panel that were shoulder to shoulder handling out key weapons in the Afghan struggle against the Russians, and that's the stinger. And in Milton, you'll see a picture in the CIA when you go in of the first shoot down of, of a helicopter. And that was taken by Milt's team. Now, of course, I got the missiles to him, but I mean, he looked good in, in the photography. So well, that well, last thing, I'll, let, I'll let Milt chime in because he had his nose on the ground. Okay, and the one impact, more question before no, uh, Jonathan, bear with me. <laughs> and I promise okay. I won't, I'll shut up at the end of this, but the impact of a weapon like the Stingers or the Javelins and how they're able to change the battlefield that cannot be underestimated. And I think without those weapons that were in position and have been, uh, you know, have, they've been training, there's other things that have been ongoing over both administrations that have made for a stronger response. But without that capability, I think it would have been uh, been a rough, a rough, uh, a rougher experience than it, uh, than the terrible experience has been. The fact that they've been able to hold the Russians to where they are, make them look uh, rather, rather feckless in a lot of ways. And I realize they're grinding down, but there's a limit to that and I want to get to that. But the importance of those weapons and bringing them into the battlefield in, in ample amounts, and they're begging for more sophisticated uh, longer range uh, la uh, rocket launchers and we should be providing them as fast as we can. Great, Jack. One quick last question, and that deals with the question of Putin's perception of the greater Russian empire and how you think that affects his, his modus operandi, the way he's operating and his behavior. Well, I mean, I think all of us, and that's uh, certainly the folks that have been in the intelligence business. I think Jonathan, when I talked to him, Rachel, I haven't had a chance to talk to you, but it's part, it's part of when he was a young man. He joined the KGB. They didn't draft him. He went to them. He went there. He was a true believer in the Soviet Union. He was, you know, he, he saw the vision of the great Russia. And he tells you over and over again, you see it in the press, you know, it was the worst day in history for him when the Soviet Union collapsed. And he's, you know, he's, he's been motivated. And that's what people have to understand. This is not just the guy who's trying to make a lot of money and, and show power. I mean, he really wants to restore Russia. And the other day, he refers to himself as Peter the Great. So maybe I had him sized as Brezhnev, of, but he's Peter the Great. So the, the, the fact that he has those ambitions are so deeply ingrained, but they're not, they were not hidden. It wasn't like, you know, at the cocktail parties at Vienna, you know, that, that he was some nice guy who didn't have ambitions, and including on Eastern Europe. So, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, he has, you know, grand ambitions. That's why I think he underestimated the response of Europe and including the neighboring countries, because they see him for what they, they saw him as the threat that they know history, what Russia represents in history. And no one in Russia, no one in Europe, their brains loves Russia, I mean, historically. Great, Chuck. Thank you. Milt, would you like to, to chime in on this one? Yeah, I'd uh, make a couple of comments on, on the weapon business Thank that Jack has, has raised. Uh, in 1986, uh, after six years of war in Afghanistan, the, the Afghans were more or less hunkered down waiting to be martyred. Uh, they were going to keep fighting, but the, the Russians really had the upper hand. They had air attack helicopters and everything. And then the decision after much debate was made in Washington, uh, the decision was made to uh, give them the Stinger anti-aircraft missile. And uh, by the end of September in 1986, the war had turned. Uh, helicopters were falling out of the skies and the Russian adventure uh, went downhill from there until uh, Gorbachev declared that it was a bleeding wound and it took him four more years to get out. But uh, that, was, that was the dimension that changed the war. The same thing in, in Ukraine. Uh, I think 
there are many different things going on with Ukraine. If you're Vladimir Vladimirovich, it's it's a last gasp to reestablish a Russian empire, never mind the Soviet empire. It's, it's sort of a great Russian empire. He has been driven, I think, uh, largely by his impression that NATO more or less moved after 1989 to 91, moved up to the borders, you know, the suburbs of St. Petersburg, and that became uh, too much for him, and we've we've ended up with this situation that we have right now. I do think that we're possibly uh, missing the point of the war, in, in so far as most of the American media has has glommed onto this wonderful romantic story of David and Goliath, and that the. Uh, uh, the, the statement being declared by a lot of observers in print and on television is that the Ukrainians have won uh, in their battle against Goliath. I'm not sure that I'd sign on to that just yet. I, I think uh, that uh, Putin has some more cards to play on this thing and not just to throw more conscripts uh, at, uh, at the Ukrainians. And uh, Jack and I saw what these conscripts could look like, a very motley crowd. Uh, we had uh, some of them that we brought out of Afghanistan. And uh, you know, this is sort of the dregs, but I think sooner or later, he'll start shoving more regular units of the, uh, of the Russian army in there. And we'll see this thing get worse before it gets any better. The problem he has is the Russian army I'm not, I wouldn't suggest it was a myth, but there's a lot of mythology in there that dates back to World War II and, and, uh, and the Great Patriotic War, where you know, I've been known to quip every so often is that the main thing the Russians did in World War II is wear out more German machine gun barrels with young Russian conscripts, which allowed us to go ashore. In, uh, in Normandy and get about our business. Uh, the, the, the Russian army is in trouble, has been in trouble for a long time and always will be in trouble as an army. Uh, but that would be a, a discussion I think for another time about what are the problems of the Russian army, but he will not get out of this thing politically alive. Uh, I think uh, he's he's going to end up paying the final the final charges in in Ukraine, but we shouldn't think that we're going to get out of this thing scot free as well. I think that already within NATO Europe EU cracks are beginning to appear, and, and to, that they're being brought into what I'm hearing from European friends is in, in, uh, they're being brought into a proxy war. Uh, between the U.S. and Russia fought out on the Ukrainian soil. And I, 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 I would suggest that we need to, to watch this as things go forward. They're also going to be challenged, that relationship, NATO, EU, U.S., uh, by China and Belt and Road. Uh, the, the, the BRI goes through Russia. It, 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 it will involve uh, you know, huge issues for Europe, positive ones as well. And uh, if we're going to try to have Europe and NATO join us in going up against China on this, and we'll, Jonathan will probably handle it, John will uh, handle this, I'm sure, uh, we're gonna run into more trouble with Europe. So there are, there are all uh, any number of issues uh, that will that will uh, flow from the Ukrainian adventure on both sides. Uh, they'll affect the China story as well as the U.S. dollar being a, a, a convertible currency. So let me leave it at that and uh, start taking questions as well. Milton, um, that was a, that was an extraordinary presentation. May I ask you, um, we, can, we can pulse questions now or I can use your discussion of the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, as an excellent segue for Jonathan to continue. It's up to you. Why don't we go Shall to- Shall we wait and open? 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Give, give John I, I, the mayor thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like because All right. so, I like your, I like I like John. I like his name too. Yeah. Jonathan, it's your your turn. <laughs> We're always there for you, Jonathan. Always there for you. <laughs> Thank you, Milton. That was a great. That was great. That was a great presentation. Great. Um, well, well, thanks everybody. Uh, great to be here on on such an awesome panel. And you know, Jack's been a mentor for many years, and it's an honor to be with um, with Milton, Rachel as well. So. Um, let me just add the China piece here. And as somebody that speaks Russian and Chinese and was initially going to do PhD work on Russia-China relations, I've been studying these countries for a long time. And I think the main thing, um, if we really zoom out and look at the big picture, I think what I'd want people to understand um, is that these are two countries that have, I think, a very clear sense of the past, the present, and the future that does not at all align with our sense of those things. And um, you know, my book, China's Vision of Victory, is very much about um, the Communist Party's idea of national resurrection, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And um, you know, as, as the Ukraine crisis has unfolded, it's been very interesting on my end to go and look at how Russia also, um, you know, especially in very recent years, is, is beginning, you know, and it's Putinism. I don't think it speaks for the whole of Russia in the same way that the Communist Party of China has its own flavor of nationalism that that animates uh, Chinese foreign policy now, but you know Putin's idea of restoring the nation and restoring the national empire and that sort of thing, and his idea uh, that the the West is sort of an illegitimate um, actor in 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 the you know uh, life of of sort of uh, the destiny of Russia, I think is is really the thing that mirrors the Communist Party and creates this very dangerous and for the moment uh, durable alliance. Um, or alignment, let's say. And, you know, Jack and I have been speaking on the Russia-China relationship together for a while. And, um, you know, when you look at how these two share an anti-American sentiment, um, a sense of national sort of uh, rejuvenation and a sense that the world order as it exists is fundamentally against their interests and, and in China's sense, built on what they used to call the unequal treaties and all sorts of things. I mean, the entire journey of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation is basically... Um, an act of throwing off the American and Western led order. So, so that's what we're dealing with. And that is just getting started. That is not ending. It shouldn't have been surprising. Um, you know, when I used to tell people what China was uh, really looking for and what that would mean for US China relations, I mean, even a few years ago, they, people, you know, would often think I was from another planet. But I think now we're seeing um, that, that this is going to be the major feature of the world that we're going to live in. Is, um, you know, particularly China's um, ability to, to go way beyond what Russia, what Russia can do in transforming the world economy, you know, global technology, these sorts of things, all of which will have to be countered and essentially defeated by the United States. And we're going to need a grand strategy that can actually stop Beijing's ambitions. And to me, the, the biggest consequence of the Ukraine uh, conflict and, and, you know, Putin's invasion is that it's essentially uncorked the bottle on, um, you know, the, the uh, essentially use of force. I mean, very uh, substantial military operations against um, a democracy by an authoritarian nation, essentially because it's a democracy. And when we look at the Taiwan Straits, I mean, that's obviously um, the program that the PRC would have in mind should they go forward. And in that sense, um, I think we really have to look at the Russia-China alignment as primarily a military alignment. I mean, the point here, I think, is that should China ever look to make good on its territorial ambitions in the Indo-Pacific, it now has Russia more or less by default on its side, um, it will come what may. And, and I think that is, um, you know, that was always there. And uh, those that were playing, paying close attention could see that, um, you know, manifesting in the sort of accelerating pace of uh, military exercises and, and what have you. But, um, but I think that's the real danger for the United States. And as for Russia, I mean, you know, I, I say this sort of glibly, but, you know, at the end of the day, Putin's achieved something that really hasn't happened in 800 years, which is now Russia is going to be a dependency on another major nation. I mean, not since the Mongols, uh, you know, sacked, uh, you know, <laughs> the sort of Western uh, Russian cities. Has that been true? So, um, you know, Russia now has nowhere to go strategically except to China. So I think that dependency is going to get built in it also creates the opportunity, I think, for US strategy to break them apart, which we will have to do. Um, not a near-term thing, but within the 2020s, I think we should be looking for ways to pull these two apart. Um, dealing with a Russia, China, and Tant um, in the near and medium term is gonna, is gonna be very uh, dangerous and difficult um, strategically. And I think the other side is that, um, you know, China for, for a very long time, or is, particularly under, in the Xi Jinping years, 
um, you know, the Communist Party has talked a great deal about using, um, you know, preparing to fight and win wars, um, fighting the bloody battles of our era. And I think the line that finally caught the world's attention was when Xi Jinping said um, that, you know, that the foreigners would essentially bash their heads bloody on the great wall formed of a billion Chinese people. So, so this is, you know, the Communist Party's ethos is absolutely built on violence. I mean, that was at the core of Mao Zedong's thinking. I think it remains, um, you know, important to Communist Party thinking. Um, so the idea that they're here to reshape the present and the future, that we're sort of in the way of that, and that they're now working together to execute that, um, that's what this really amounts to in my mind. And, um, you know, that's going to require a, a revision in U.S. grand strategy that we haven't seen since the Eisenhower years. Um, and we're going to have to be able to, um, you know, as Jack and I have, have written and spoken on often, I mean, pursue a dual track containment policy of two um, you know, quite dangerous places. And that's going to be economic, principally on the China side, and then obviously, um, you know, very sophisticated defense strategy in, in both Europe and Asia. So, so big things ahead for America. I mean, we're going to have to get this right. The world is being transformed, um, you know, before our eyes. Jonathan, could you, could you discuss that dual track policy in greater detail, or would you like to leave that for another, another session, your perception of what has to be done? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, I mostly am focused on the, the China issue and, and U.S. strategy towards China and working on a new book about that now. And um, what I think it really amounts to is economic containment of China. I mean, you basically have to take this, um, you know, Cold War era concept. It's not unique to the Cold War, but where you basically are going to go after the elements that create growth in an adversary state, um, you know, export controls, I and mean, that's very relevant to um, you know, this particular audience, export controls, investment bans, um, import substitutions in order to slow down the growth to, you know, reconstitute the world economy so that its true basis is the U.S. alliance system and the sort of global democracies, which make up 60 to 70 percent of global wealth and GDP, um, pull our supply chains essentially out of China, particularly in, in strategic industries, and make sure that we're not financing and funding their, um, you know, ongoing acceleration and, and you know, human rights abuses and military buildup. And all of that can be done through policy tools that essentially already exist, but they've never been applied to something this large. And we've never dealt with an economic peer competitor. Um, you know, we've never had a larger economy go against us since the War of 1812. So we still have a window here uh, to prevent them from actually becoming the world's largest economy. And, and if we don't, and not, not enough people talk about that. I think many people assume that it's either inevitable that they will or inevitable that they won't. At the end of the day, we're going to have to, to do work in order to make sure that that doesn't happen. And, and that absolutely um, comes down to um, the relationship between US government and the private sector. And, and if Barbara Linney had been um, on the panel today, I mean, she works closely, of course, with, um, with corporations on export controls and national security and sanctions. I mean, that would have been a fascinating perspective because you know, I, I too work with executives and boardrooms and you, know, you need the policy space to shape the boardroom in such a way where they're making decisions that are better for long-term and near-term US national security. And the exodus of corporations from Russia, I think is getting people um, you know, a taste of what it's really like to go and build a business in a very dangerous state not to worry too much about how dangerous that place is until something really big happens. They're all, you know, every company is doing this in China today and China is no less dangerous than Putin's Russia. So, um, so we need our corporations, I think, to return um, to the US side, uh, to the arsenal of democracy, forget this multinational sort of, we're gonna be in, in every state regardless of the politics and intentions, ambitions and strategies. Um, that world is, is I think, um, you know, very much on, on the way out and it was never that real. In, in many ways. So um, we're going to need a new alignment of industry and uh, national security in order to have a, have a chance um, in this contest and in order to keep this a peacetime contest. And that's the thing that I'd really like to emphasize is you know, I do think that um, in the broader picture, much like the Cold War, there is the opportunity um, to have a peacetime victory over the combined approach of Russia and China and to, and to thwart their ambitions without having to let this all disintegrate into, into major power conflict. But we're going to lose that window if we don't get the economic side right. So the clock is ticking on that one. John, I'm going to ask you one more question. And then, of course, I want Jack and Milton and Rachel to comment. Jack, besides, I mean, John, besides export controls and economic sanctions, which is a way for US law to guide behavioral patterns of our corporations. It's where the rubber hits the road with SDNs, et cetera. What are the other tools that can be used in your perception to push back against both the BRA, BRI and, and the uh, PRC's perception and attempt to gain, to gain sovereignty 
or dominance in, in the world order? Well, I, I think you need to ultimately pool allied capital and create alternatives. I mean, we need to find a way to unlock the, um, you know, tremendous, uh, you know, wealth reserves of, of the um, OECD and, and NATO itself is half of global wealth. The OECD is 70%. So, you know, if you can start to take um, private sector institutions and, you know, national governments creating the right sort of initiatives, um, you can go and, and sort of lower the cost of capital in, in regions that are strategically important, but also have a decent or to good business case, as long as there's a little bit of long-term support coming from government. So, you know, something like, an, a, you know, an Indo-Pacific investment bank that, that's, you know, joined by, let's say, the Quad and, and European nations, where you, you throw sovereign wealth fund level uh, capitalization towards the kinds of projects that you'd want to make sure uh, could could swing the political balance towards uh, the West and not um, towards the PRC. And then in the meantime, um, you know, uh, some good investment bans would go a long way. I mean, there's no reason for our pension funds to be pouring money into um, you know civil military fusion enterprises and and you know human rights abuses and and all sorts of other things which um you know china's corporations are its fundamental vehicle for economic expansion and right now they're many of them are investable on western markets and that, that just doesn't make any sense in in a contest like that. Uh, uh, one quick question rachel uh, she's wondering if that strategically could backfire in the long term say that again I'm sorry, Rachel. Rachel had a question. Your concerns actually backfiring in the long term. I was term. just wondering so what the you, counter arguments to that are. I mean, it, I mean, if, yeah, yeah. If, what are the best counter arguments to kind of your proposal of dismantling basically multilateral engagement with China, getting everyone to reinvest? You know, American corporations, America first, get on board with us. Don't trust China. I mean, isn't aren't there strong counter arguments on the other side that more multilateral engagement is better versus versus less? Um, look, so, Rachel, you... before before Don, Rachel, can yeah. I just clarify just for a second, just so I understand, I'm interpreting the question correctly. I don't think Jonathan's. I, I think maybe we're looking at the the methods and the processes. We discuss export controls and economic sanctions, where the rubber hits the road or other tools. We don't bring into line the, the large teleological perspective, but we accomplish that practically, you know, by pushing back, for instance, the BRI. If you recognize non-traditional forms of power projection through investment banks, you can apply traditional tools of U.S. foreign policy and national security. If you don't recognize it, you can't push back. I'm sorry, Simon, please go ahead. Sure. I and, and, uh, uh, reading the question in the box, which says counter arguments to economic strategy of painting China as the enemy, I, th I think we should... You know, um, let's put it this way. I, I don't think we picked this fight. Uh, the, the economic engagement strategy is 40 years old now, and I'm pretty, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that Washington has uh, decided that that has not been, the, you know, a very successful approach. And, and you know, regarding China as, as an enemy, I mean, it, it happens to be their newspapers and, and sort of public messaging that paints us as the enemy and has for quite some time. And, you know, should, should anything be lost on us when it comes to genocide or military buildup or practicing on U.S., you know, aircraft carrier models in the Xinjiang desert for missile exercises? Um, let's just look at the Russia-China uh, joint bomber flights uh, last month, you know, in the middle of Putin's invasion. I don't think that we are misreading this at this point. Um, if anything, we're reading it all too late. But I think, you know, there's a very significant bipartisan consensus at this point. And the multilateralism, I think, matters mostly on how we engage each other in the democratic world. It's not going to change China. Um, that, that I think the, the West has just gone through maybe one of the biggest experiments in its history of how to change China. Um, economic engagement, liberalization, all of that. I mean, that's a well-told story at this point. Um, so, so I think we've, uh, we're entering a new phase, but, you know, I mean, that's, that's just something as, as a historian, I mean, happy to, happy to watch with everyone as, as, you know, certain aspects of that just prove themselves. Rachel, do you want to follow up or shall I? Um... No, please do. I thought that was excellent. Thank you. Okay, that was great, Jonathan. Um, you know, Jonathan, I'm going to, I don't want to take us off course. I don't want to earn the uh, ire. Of our, I've always wondered, and one day we can speak about it offline, the worldview, the Chinese versus the Russian worldview as it relates to what the Russians would call Zakon and operation. I mean, the, we look at the South China Sea, and I've always wondered if Chinese operations in the South China Sea were arising from the fact that the worldview of conflict is so fundamentally different than the Russian worldview of conflict. For instance, we know the Russians utilized law as a utilitarian tool. We saw it in the Ukraine. When it serves their interests, it's upheld. When it doesn't, it's thrown aside. Would you like to, I mean, just out of curiosity, 
would you, I mean, as we look to methodology, can we use that methodology and understand forms of power projection so we can use a lot of counter same? That's a very theoretical and abstract question. I need to catch you off guard on that. Well, but we I, have to recognize our adversary's methodology before we can counter it. Sure. And I, I think that, um, you know, th this is going to sound like what I've been saying already, but um, what we really have to get used to is that I think China's um, ha has a very clear and, and developed at this point, uh, you know, idea of how to use global economic strategy as the basis for, for statecraft. And I think we've been good at that in the past, but not recently. Um, so that's the game that we're going to be in. Whereas with Russia, I think it's something we're probably more used to. I mean, Jack knows this better than, than anyone. I mean, what that's like, Jack and Milton understand this very well. But uh, with China, America is going to have to learn how to do global economic competition. Um, and and we, we basically, in the Cold War, we inherited the position of economic, you know, um, I mean, we were 40, 50 percent of the world economy at that point. And, and we used that to set up a global architecture that um, largely lasted 75 years. And now we have to basically go back to a reconstruction phase. Um, and China's busy trying to construct its own version of that. And they have tools that we don't even think of as tools. I mean, their corporations are tools for that. That is not how we look at things. And just to make a comment that sometimes we overfocus on the government, the government relationship on how things uh, operate. There's no doubt that the warming of a relationship with China was critical in, in history. And the objective was that somehow by the warming up, they would become part of the uh, rule of law and part of a, a bigger uh, community, world community. And what I think, you know, when we're looking at the policy side, we weren't looking at the economic side. And a lot of private business, and as uh, Jonathan points out, pension funds, a lot of people invested because it was good business, a way to make a buck in China. And I think what got lost in that was the expectation that China was going to turn out to be a real counterweight and that it was not going to change, as Jonathan rightfully points out. So I think we've reached a point now where there's now, and Russia has helped in this by its actions. It's made people go back and say, what about my supply chain? What happens if China goes to Taiwan? What's going to happen? How? So there, I think business is going to be a little more timid about, about China at the same time that our policymakers. So my only point that I'm making is that we shouldn't, we, we need to make sure that we're following economic trends that are sort of devoid of geopolitical strategy. They're just going to go where the money is and they're going to back out where the money is not going to be favorable. And I think we've reached that inflection point. What's not clear to me is just how sharp that inflection point is. I'd, I'd Nelson? Agree, uh, I'd agree with Jack on this. Uh, uh, we're, we're at a point We've spent so much time getting China wrong. Uh, uh, we, we sort of, it's either a pearl s buck China or uh, the, the, the China that's going to be bombing San Francisco. This is, this is a new, we've got to get some new thinking on, on China. We got to get some new thinking on this as Jonathan, I think has brought out this uh, China Russia thing. This isn't like the 1950s before the, the Sino-Soviet split in, in, the, in the early 60s. That was Khrushchev and, and, and Mao and, and, and orthodoxy and all of that. Right now, this is a very big deal, I think, that China and Russia are coming together. It involves energy. It involves some of the brilliance of, of Russian uh, scientific accomplishments, linking up with Chinese manpower and energy uh, moving in, in towards China from Russia. So that's a new, that's a new China-Russia thing. And I'm not sure anybody has, has articulated that too well. The other thing that I, I want to come back to on both Russia and China is you know, Putin doesn't really have a great product. If you ask, you know, what was the Cold War about? We were in a struggle with an ideology. I mean, it was an ideology that really challenges, talked about the reorganization of economic, social, political life. It was a message. Okay. And today, and today, uh, and today the, the, the question would be, what is Putin selling? Well, I get to the same issue on China. 
And that's why there's some optimism in this. I mean, what is what is China selling, right? I mean, is, or is the world full of optimism about taking the China model? Where you see large pockets of support for China is its efficiency or seeming efficiency about how it's structured its economy in a more fascist mode than a communist mode, I might point out. So my point is when you look at the alliances, which at some point in, in the world view, right, I, I do uh, side with uh, the seriousness that Jonathan and Milder are pointing to, this is a different relationship with the Chinese. They need each other, although I think the Chinese have an eye on, they need Russia far less and they wanna make sure it's not a liability. But there's not a world out there that is rushing to join that alliance. And while there's some wavering, it's really over money again. You know, why are the Indians doing what they're doing? Because they need the weapons. And it's not because they believe in Russia and the future of Russia. And we ought to overlay it in their country and their people believe that. So I think, you know, there's a, an ideological part of this bigger struggle that, as, as Milton was saying, we need some new, new thinking about what, what we're dealing with here. So uh, I want to plant that seed that this is not the inevitable China domination of the world. There's, there's a lot of pressure points and a lot of things that lie ahead that are going to get in their way. And the more they align with, with Russia, the less attractive they'll become. And I'm just one little note on Taiwan. You know, they better be thinking about, you know, re readjusting their timeline instead of 2027. They got to be pushing it out further. So uh, or if, if not, they will speed up our rethinking, uh, even including people that invest money there. I have a question from the audience, but I may pose it, and that is one of my posts. What about Chinese or PRC Russian relations post Putin? Can anyone create a prediction? Well, when, so, when are we? When is Putin leaving? <laughs> I said he was leaving, but when? When do you see that happening, John? Well, let me melt your. I mean, and Rachel, please, everyone else, chime in. But my view of post Russia, this is an argumentative thing. Does it go on? A, uh, does it become an autocratic government with just a different head? In my view, my hope, my aspiration in the post-Putin uh, government, I think there's another opportunity to reset. <laughs> I do, really do. And I think we better take advantage of it very quickly to solidify a relationship with and try and the degree we can bring them in line with uh, you know, democracy and the West and the capitalism and so on. I, but I think there, if, if it falls, it's not going to be to have a tougher Putin. It would be because Putin's policies failed. Who's ever coming in has to have a new story or, or that person will not last. Thank you, Jack. Jonathan or Milton or Rachel, would you like to opine on that? Well, I would say that uh, uh, most of the people who remember the last time around uh, when uh, Russia opened up, um, uh, 91 or, or, or so. And then the, the Russians who saw all of those Americans, Jeffrey Sachs and everybody else flooding into Moscow and, and helping them change the way they were going to uh, run the place, they're pretty much gone. So those memories, I think, will be gone. But in a, in a post-Putin era, uh, we're going to have to try to get it right uh, on whatever our policy will be uh, to do it right the first time instead of uh, perhaps uh, bungling it uh, like we may have done last time. I'm not sure we did, but I think we ended up that way. Uh, which, it, uh, But it's, it's going to be something that will require uh, a good deal of cleverness on the part of an American government to get it right. I agree 100%. I think we've lost Jonathan's video or audio. On that note, I'd like to ask if perhaps um, before we conclude the panel, I'd like to make a plug. Perhaps we should do another program on export controls and economic sanctions as it relate to Chinese or PRC and Russian relations, because unfortunately Barbara couldn't make it today. But if there are any other questions from our audience or our panelists, I have one last plug for you, Milton, a question for you, any concerns? your recent article on Afghanistan 
I said, I'm not Afghanistan, I'm in Ukraine. Putin's Afghanistan. So I just wanted to give a plug to that article. I've, it was an extraordinary article, and I think you can't get closer if you want to have an understanding of U.S. activity, not U.S., I'm sorry, Russian activity in Ukraine, and the U.S. and allied ability to push back without reading that article. And you can't get closer than Jack and Milton to those yeah. who pushed Russia out of Afghanistan and the analogy drawn by Milton. Well, let me, let me, uh, if, if, if uh, Putin decides that he has to double down and, 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 and actually occupy uh, either all or a great part of, uh, of Ukraine, it, the Ukraine would be a perfect setup for that army to, to have nothing but uh, nightmares. It's got 800 miles of, or, or almost a thousand miles of border with some very friendly countries. Uh, uh, I think if the, the, the key questions is, would the, the Ukrainians mount a, uh, an insurgency against a Russian occupation? My answer to that would be yes, they would, and they would be easily, easily supplied in this thing. So if he were to put in big quotes, win and occupy, that would be the, the beginning of, a, of another national nightmare. It was a 10 year adventure in Afghanistan, but I think you know, when Jack and I saw when we really got serious, that uh, was about the mid 1980s, about halfway through the Russian occupation. Up until that point, we were very happy as a, as a nation to fight to the last Afghan and let them sort of sort it out themselves. And then I think it was Bill Casey and Ronald Reagan said, let's try to win that thing. And then it all changed and money happened and stingers happened. That's already happened in, in Ukraine. That decision has already been made. And, and I agree, obviously, Mel, because we shared common experiences. But with regard to the op-ed, I want to make one point really clear. I'm not proposing we try and get push Putin out, okay? I'm very careful that it really has to be the Russian people that decide. We shouldn't be doing covert action. We shouldn't be trying musking around. We'll screw it up. And we are going to you know, extend his stay rather than uh, end it. But I think the ingredients that we talked about today are built for you know, his, his decline and demise. And I think it'll be the Russian people. It has to be the Russian people. We need to leave that one alone in terms of sub rosa intervention and, and that uh, and those types of things. So I'm not advocating it. I hope the sooner he leaves, the better. I think we can get along with the, the new world with lots of optimism, but we shouldn't try to kid ourselves so we can speed that process up. Well, if I, I have one more question, if I may, and we'll hopefully conclude this panel, and that's to Jonathan. Jonathan, one of our audience members asked the question, parenthetical, your comments are very important and insightful, but I'm wondering about your comment open quote, we don't look at our corporations as tools, close quote, in the global economic competition. Isn't that because most of the large corporations think of themselves as global entities, even if they were founded in the US? I think your larger point was that we, open paren, US policymakers, close paren, need to build partnerships with the private sector that enable them to understand how they will benefit from making business decisions that are consistent with US policy. I leave that to you, Jonathan, that was for you. It was a great question. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. And, and, you know, what I said was that, that China, you know, the Communist Party sees their corporations as tools. I mean, that's very much what they are. I mean, the SASAC corporations are owned and essentially operated by the Chinese government. And that's what we're dealing with. That's how they do a great deal of their global expansion. It's a lot of what the Belt and Road is. That's what the islands in the South China Sea are. And, and the point here, and um, I think this is actually kind of the exciting part about the 2020s and, and so on, is that um, you really do have to reimagine um, the American multinational corporation. It has to be sort of a, um, you know, battle ready enterprise um, for global competition with Chinese SOEs in a period of geopolitical change, the likes of which we haven't seen in, you know, a couple of generations. Um, we didn't have these issues in the Cold War because you didn't have a fully integrated global economy, but we have been here before. I mean, in the 1930s, um, you know, American business leaders were being honored in Munich. Uh, Thomas Watson, uh, you know, IBM founder was, uh, or, you know, one of the early IBMers, 
uh, was, was given a medal by Adolf Hitler in Berlin. And the motto of the conference in 1937 was trade, you know, peace through trade. So, so, you know, we've been in these periods of globalization ahead of the First World War, you know, sort of partially ahead of the Second World War. And, uh, you know, history of global business is very, actually very attached to geopolitics. And I think it's only in the, the post-Cold War era that the multinational globally integrated enterprises sort of thrived without deep consideration for which kind of countries uh, they're dealing with and what the ultimate intentions and consequences of those countries' governments' strategies are in the world. And, and so that's, I think, the, the rethink that every boardroom uh, needs to do. And, um, you know, and I think it's also a very, very important piece ultimately of US grand strategy. Um, our Fortune 500 alone, the 500 biggest corporations in America are two thirds of US GDP. So, um, you know, this is, that is our economy. I mean, the, the companies are our economy. We're a private economy and we're gonna have to get ready uh, to win a global economic competition. And I think we can do that actually in a very positive way, which is you're going to need our companies to be more successful than China's um, you know, state-owned and state-backed enterprises um, in every global market and every major technology that matters. And ultimately to, to make decisions that are much more in line, I think, with US national security and long-term stability, because as much as people may pride themselves on being global rather than American, I think we can all understand that without um, an American cornerstone to, to uh, world order, uh, things come apart pretty fast. So uh, consequences are already being seen. Um, so rebuilding will, will take place, I think, in the boardrooms as much as in the US government. And that partnership needs to come together uh, right away, in my mind. May I ask Jack, Milt, um, or, or Jonathan, even Rachel? Rachel, Rachel, you're not an expertise in intelligence, but no, Milton and Jack. Was, but my question is, in terms of tainted supply chain, like the use of ergo forced labor, um, it, what methods or what kind of intelligence can be operationalized to determine when those supply chains are tainted with forced labor, like the ergers? So uh, wittingly or unwittingly, US and allied corporations won't be involved in deriving benefit from that exploitation whether it's forced labor or murder or any of the other forms, even the re-education camps that were utilized. Hey, would anyone like right. to address I defer the Rachel. I, I defer the Rachel. What? Uh, All right. I defer the Rachel. I mean, this Good is idea. the rule of law. I think the rule of law. Yeah. Built by our outlaws. That's not true. My gosh. <laughs> Rachel? Everything Mel and I did is sponsored by the Department of uh, Justice. Let me get the record straight. About the delicate yeah. balance, or maybe at times not so delicate balance between, you know, adhering to a national strategy of and national values of we believe in the rule of law domestically and internationally, but we also believe in circumventing it when we need to the ultimate necessity. I mean, I mean, how many nuclear scientists have been assassinated now assassinated a violation of international law in Iran. And the world goes, oh, what just happened, right? There's tacit approval, right? At least there's no, there hasn't been condemnation uh, of it. And, and I think we all know who, who's engaged in, the, in those assassinations and, and, and understandably why uh, so, uh, perhaps with US, US involvement or, or not, um, and you know, certainly, and then going back to Stuxnet. But you know, at what point do all those things, and that was my comment about Subros intervention as well. At what point does, <laughs> some of the things that we do that are in contravention to the overall rule of law, or at least are not allowed by it, um, you know, actually undermine the rule of law. But I think there's some clear distinctions to make and things like spycraft has, has, has long been part of and, and accommodated by the rule, the rule of law. Yes, you know, spies, you know, there's even interesting, you know, uh, categorization of, of spies under 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 the law of war. Um, everyone uses spies, right? It's not considered a huge, a huge thing. You know, you 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 may be executed by by engaging in 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 sabotage behind the enemy lines, not in uniform, but it happens. Um, um, so I mean, I think it does raise some interesting things versus you know the United States going in and meddling and overthrowing the Shah of 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 wherever, um, or, you know, going into South American countries and, and doing some nasty things or doing what we did with, with, with South Vietnam or with yeah. Vietnam originally. So I, I, you know, I think those things are very, are separate and, you know, 
I, how do we know that the supply and yes, supply chain is tainted by Uyghur concentration camps? But I think that goes back to some of Jonathan's excellent points is that this is about the private sector. And I think Jack and Milton echoed that as well. And the private sector, Skechers has a responsibility, right? And needs to be demanded by its customers to determine whether or not its supply chain is tainted by concentration camp labor, right? In, in a, in a, in with, involved with, you know, in, related to ethnic cleansing and genocide of the Uyghurs by, by China. Um, you had other companies that came on board like Nike and said, we're going to look into this. Skechers was like, oh, well, didn't want to answer that. But I, you know, so I think there's a lot more that needs to be done there. But I, I think it's, it's the company's responsibility. Um, there, I mean, there are codes of, and, and should be codes of, of moral conduct and ethical, con you know, ethical responsibility for these companies, but that I'll stop there. I just want to finish where I introduced Rachel by saying, the Department of Justice signed up to everything we did. And I want to say that seriously. People have to understand that CIA, when it operates sub rosa, it is a, in an action area. This is approved by the President of the United States. I know of no case, and I, did, I spent a lot of time looking at this and being part of it, that, that covert action wasn't signed by the President of the United States. And the second thing is, there are only a couple examples that I can think of. And they became large political flaps is when it wasn't coordinated with the Department of Justice. So movies aside, uh, glib remarks aside, we need to understand that, and, and, and I think Rachel would appreciate this and knows this, that inside our own system, there's a very legal overlay of, of the activities that, um, that we've talked about today. Yeah, but I don't, but legal doesn't yeah, mean Rachel, more Rachel, correct, Rachel, Matt, or, Rachel, or lawful under international law. I just want to highlight Rachel, that. Rachel, 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 something's good. Rachel, I'm Rachel, 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 Right to take out a nuclear reactor when an opponent threatens to wipe you off the face of the earth is, I think, pretty clearly within the Articles 51 of the UN Charter in self-defense. Now, if the U.S. would have preferred that Israel utilize tactical strikes with F-15s or F-16s, I think that would have created a big blowout in the international legal order. So what I, the question I was pulsing towards Jack and everyone else was not their official role in the CIA. Generally, theoretically, what's the role? Imminence, of course, is another criteria. But anticipatory self-defense under the three paradigms have different 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 measuring us. But my question for Jack and Jonathan, theoretically, is what role can intelligence be used or information to determine when those supply chains are tainted? That's all. It wasn't. Let me, turn, let, me turn over to John, let me turn over to Jonathan with this one. Uh, and, and Jack is right. An MON is required for covert operations, a memorandum notification. I wasn't bringing that to question. I just wanted to know how how the US intelligence community could be of assistance in determining when those supply chains are, are tainted. That was all. The only point I want to make, let me turn it over to you, Jonathan. These are policy decisions. This isn't the intelligence community, the NIC's role to decide this. This is a policy decision, and that is rightfully where it belongs in a democracy. The political leaders of this country have to make those decisions and not the IC. So I, I think the IC shouldn't even engage and what's right, wrong. I mean, in other words, you have to do that as a person to decide where you stand on a moral issue. But the policy is really important that the intelligence community remain responsive to policy and to changes in administrations and so on. They cannot be a policymaker. But let me give you the Jonathan, because I don't want us to get down thinking that this is part of the IC's uh, writ. Um. I would say, you know, when it comes to, for instance, um, intelligence assistance on supply chains, I, I think that there are things that um, the U.S. and allied intelligence community should be doing with companies and, and sort of in a two-way street type way. But um, I think that the, you know, the use of, of forced labor um, in American supply chains, I think, um, you know, falls very broadly under the category of bad decisions that companies make in dangerous places. And I, th I think it's, it really falls to them to, to, to make better decisions and to, and to appreciate um, the risks they're taking in, in a place like China 
um, at a level that that does have a bit of a cost to them. I mean, it, it's it, it, you know, I'm, I think the U.S. government should do everything it can to set the parameters and make it um, you know illegal to be engaging in that sort of thing. But the companies have to understand what they're getting into when they're operating in China. Is they're getting into a world in which that is. Um, that's how things are done there. And, and, and that bigger, broader lesson, I think, is, uh, you know, um, is the one they need to learn, not, not just not only uh, making sure that their supply chains do not include that, but understanding that they're dealing in a place and, and integrating it into their fundamental business strategies when, when, when there are human rights atrocities going on, um, you know, on, and at the direction of, of, the, of that national government. So, so I, I think they, they need to understand that that's just, that's a, a bad place to be period um, when you're taking on those kinds of risks. Thank you. If anyone else has any comments, I'd like to conclude our panel and ask Angela if she can um, disengage. That was an extraordinary panel. It was robust, the discussions were great. Thank you, Jonathan, thank you, Jack, thank you, Milton, and thank you, Rachel. And thank you to EBA, the International Law Section for hosting this program. Hopefully to come, we'll have another part in export controls and economic sanctions as they fit into the interplay with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and China's activity.